All right. Yeah, we're good. Do we need to check to make sure people can see? People can, should be able to see. Okay. Let's make sure we speak loudly and get that microphone in. Okay. All right. I just learned that uh, folks aren't able to really ask questions unless we allow them. So hopefully everyone can hear me and see what's on the screen. Uh, the what I'm showing you right now is our ArcGIS online platform, one of the many mapping capabilities that we that we have in the program. Um, we use this to uh, to disseminate geospatial data and build uh, applications like the one I'm going to show you. Um, I've put the right RAD Minority Concentration Analysis web map right on the front page so that I don't have to give you some long, complicated URL to remember. You can just remember to go to hud.maps.arcgis.com, and we can uh, circulate that URL uh, after the meeting so you guys have it. Uh, but right here on the ribbon on the front page is the web map that I've been describing to you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and click on it, bring it up so you see how it works. So it just happens to be focused on Cleveland, but you can zoom or pan to anywhere in the country and get the uh, information. I'm just going to orient you real quick. If you go to the I button on the left panel, uh, we'll give you a basic uh, description of, uh, of what the what the web map is for. If I click the more details uh, button, it opens up uh, a, a description page for the item. And most of what we talked about, uh, most of what Celia talked about, and also what I talked about in terms of how we calculated the data is documented here in the details. I won't go through that at great length because we've already talked about it. But I'll just show you how the application works. Uh, you can see that the uh, that you have a base map here that's got place names on it. Don't want to give me an address. Anyone? One five six North Keats Avenue. One five six North. How do you spell? K E A T S. All right. Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville. All right. It already automatically. So I'm going to go and see if that uh, address meets uh, the minority concentration definition. It doesn't. I can actually zoom out a little bit further to see if there are any other uh, census tracts nearby that do. The answer to that is no. If I click on the map uh, where the address was located, you can see that the census tract is highlighted. Oh, and there is one over there in the corner you can see. So uh, if I scroll down through this info box, I can see all of the information that was used in the calculation. So for example, I can see the census tract uh, number which happens to be, uh, in this case, uh, Census Tract 74. For those of you who are uh, a little bit confused by these codes, uh, the first two digits is the state FIPS code, this next three digits is the county FIPS code, and then the six digits after that, six digits after that is the tract code. Um, some, and sometimes you'll see this with a decimal. Uh, uh, sometimes you'll see it as a full six character code. Um, but really, the way that reads is it's track number 74 in Jefferson County, uh, Kentucky. So uh, what you can see is that it's also part of the Louisville, Jefferson County, uh, Kentucky, Indiana metropolitan <laughs> statistical area. So that is the name of the housing market area that we're using to um, compare the demographic information with. And you can see that we have all the racial and ethnic categories broken out. Um, obviously, white alone is not used in the calculation, but everything after that is. So you've got black or African American, non-Hispanic, both expressed as a uh, number and as a percent of total population. And so that will repeat for every class. So it goes from black or African American down to American Indian and Alaskan Native, down to Asian, down to Native Hawaiian uh, and other Pacific Islander down to uh, some other race, and then two or more races, and then finally Hispanic or Latino. And these are all mutually exclusive categories. So you get all of those numbers for the census tract, and then those numbers repeat again for the calculation that is all adjacent census tracts. 
And then finally, if you keep scrolling, they repeat again for all of the, uh, the categories for the housing market area that we compared it with, right? So there's a lot of data there, and it's for three distinct geographies, the core census tract, all adjacent census tracts, and then the housing market area. And then at the very bottom, we've included an actual bar chart that looks at each individual uh, race type. Uh, and so you can actually scroll through each one. So starting with black or African-American, if you mouse over each bar, it will tell you which geography uh, that was for. So for example, um, the, the, the core tract value is 7.27%. Uh, 7 uh, that's this number down here. The middle bar is always the adjacent, all the adjacent tracks, including the core tract. And then the top one is the housing market area. So it actually gives you a visual way of sort of comparing the, the numbers uh, for each race. And so you can scroll through each race category uh, just like that. And also I forgot to mention that we did it for the total as well because that's part of the minority concentration ana uh, analysis is if you sum all the minority classes up to a total and, and do the comparison that way. So let's pick an address that is inside of one. Um, I think Jordan's been giving me one. Is it East Monument? Yeah, 1400 East Monument Street. There you go. Let's look that one up. I think you can also blow up the pop-up box. You can look at all that information basically at the same time, too, right? You, you might be able to resize it. I'll try that in a second. This is Baltimore? Baltimore? Yep. Thank you. All right, so you can see I'm just going to type in that address. It's going to locate the address, and you can see in this case, you're, we're in, that, in that, um, that zone that's in this opaque rose color here. Uh, and as you can see, you get the same information. Uh, to answer your question, I cannot resize this. On the top, that one I can better. blow it up, yeah, yeah, but you still don't get all of it. Oh, okay. um, but you get a lot more of it, right? So one thing I'll point out is in addition to all the raw numbers and the percentages, we have these flags that will tell you which one of the tests triggered the minority concentration tag. So in this case, it's a binary indicator where one equals yes and zero equals no. So in this case, you can see that this tract was considered minority concentration because the the core tract was 20 percent percentage points higher higher uh, in in at least one of the of the minority groups. Then the this this indicator is also one because the cumulative of all the minority groups was 20 percent higher than the housing market area. And then the the next one down is the test for. Uh, the adjacent tract. So if you include all the adjacent tracts, including this core tract, and, and you do uh, you know um, the test for one or more groups that meet the 20% or higher criteria, you get a yes there. So this one is a yes on all fronts. But remember that it only has to be yes in any one of those to be considered minority concentration. So what we've tried to do here is, like I said, take a lot of the burden off the staff that would have otherwise had to figure out what tract the address was in, pull all this data from the census, here it's all for you in one place. All you got to do is type in the address, click on the map to get the information back. So I'm going to stop here because we're running short on time. And if anyone has any questions, I don't know if you're taking them now. Go ahead and shoot. Let's take them now. choose which adjacent tracks we want to be included in the analysis of concentration. For example, if we're familiar with the geographic area and know that something, a highway for example, divides neighborhoods and therefore it doesn't make sense to include all adjacent census tracts, can we ask the prototype to not include certain adjacent census tracts? No. The prototype is pre, pre, pre calculates the, the calculation, the, the minority concentration analysis. Um, and uh, you cannot interact with the map and ask it to recalculate for a group of your own selected tracks. However, that is a functionality that is going to be in phase two of the project when we do user-defined areas. So I would, um, I would 
ask the product owner for this, who happens to actually be in Office of Housing, it's Lisa Floyd, to make sure that that's in her user stories for the application. Um, because the user story right now says user wants to draw an area, their own area. If, <coughs> if, uh, if we want them to be able to select census tracts specifically and say that's my custom area, then we make sure we need to make sure that that's included in the user story. But the prototype as it is now, all this information has been pre-calculated. The adjacency calculation was done for the entire country all at one time, and it's reflected in this data set, so you can't change it. We have a question from Jeff. We are wondering why the third standard for identifying an area of minority concentration, over 50% of the population is minority, was omitted from definition. And this might have been from an earlier section that we just didn't address. We're thinking. Okay. Do you want to address it? Yeah. Involved in the notice? I'm, or? I'm trying to read the question. Oh, okay. Uh, it's about the third prong of the definition of minority concentration where an area is over 50% minority. And that's that's usually the third prong of a uh, definition of area minority concentration that we've used in the past. But I know for the purposes of RAD, it, it was taken out during the notice negotiation. It's vaguely ringing a bell, yeah, okay. and there was a rationale for right. why it was done. Um, let me try to go back and retrace yeah. the steps and I'll follow up with Jeff. Okay. Or with we'll with, with, with Chris yeah. and yeah. Celia. Okay. Anything else? Uh, Dustin. Okay. Yeah, we have a question from Dustin. Curious if there are any potential pitfalls with the development not being located in an area of minority concentration under the RAD purview, but being located in an R uh, slash ECAP as defined under AFFH. You can read the rest of it. Is it possible? Yeah. Is it possible that a development could not be in a census tract designated as a minority concentration? but not designated as an uh, RECAP under the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule. I think he meant but designated, not yeah. but not designated. And I could but see oh, that. Yeah, yeah. Even with the 61? Yeah. I, I, I don't know if I want to answer, ask, but I don't want to say, I want to say yes, it's possible, but I could be wrong. Okay. I mean, it's two separate, it's completely separate definitions of they're not they're not meant to be the same um, for whatever reason which not my purview to go into the definition for minority concentration for the purposes of the, the front end civil rights review for rad or phase one completely different from the definition of racial and ethnically concentrated areas of poverty used in the AFFH program there may be some overlap there are also maybe some differences. All right, do we have any other questions? Uh, Kimberly uh, is noting that the 50% minority prong of the definition was um, omitted to take into account majority minority jurisdictions. Oh. We're going to double check that to make sure, but I think Kimberly, um, everybody's nodding their heads and think that's, uh, um, that's the same recollection here. Um, hi, this is Shira Gordon. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, some of the alternative geographies. Um, I'll start with a discussion of the RAD notice and then a little bit more about the King v. Harris case 
and if I have time, um, I can show you some things in the AFFHT data mapping tool. But um, so the civil, Rad Civil Rights Notice says that, um, as Celia explained, um, the area minority concentration generally uses census tracts or adjacent census tracts, um, but um, alternative geographies um, may be appropriate. Um, and there are three things that are stated. One, the site is located close to the edge of the census tract. Two, the population of the census tract is heavily influenced by the size of the converting project. Or three, the local community understanding of the immediate neighborhood dictates a different boundary. Um, and the notice lists factors including, one, patterns of housing stock, including um, different residential de densities in the different areas um, or different housing prices, two, community facilities and amenities, such as schools and commercial areas, or finally, major geographic barriers, such as rivers or interstate highways. Um, and it says that HUD will use the best available evidence and follow the legal standards, and it cites King v. Harris. Um, alternative geographies can also be relevant for determining the housing market area, um, but I won't go. And then um, the only examples listed for that are um, job centers and commuting patterns. Um, so going, so the RAD notice cites the King v. Harris case, but I thought I'd speak briefly about the facts of that case. It was a case in the Eastern District of New York in 1979, and it took place on Staten Island, where um, there was a proposed housing site in an area, in the site was called Ten Hill. Um, it was located in, in Census Tract 29, and HUD, um, only looked at that census tract in deciding to approve it. And um, residents of that area sued HUD and the, pro the builder of the project saying that it would have um, a negative impact on what was currently a racially balanced community. Um, the court ended up looking at parts of two other census tracts, tracts 29 and 40, because there, were, there was a group of about four or five other um, housing complexes with um, that were um, publicly supported housing. Um, they looked at um, the fact that the community felt that they that the neighborhood they were in was not the same thing as the census tract. So um, HUD can be required to look at um, alternative geographies, including um, sort of smaller portions of multiple census tracts rather than one census tract or even the normal standard of one census tract or um, census tract and adjacent census tracts. Um, I think I'm going to go to um, the affirmatively further and fair housing um, data mapping tool called AFHT. Um, and So, Haley, do you want to explain, um, give some of the background of where this example, the Southbury okay. example came from? Sure. Um, Kira is going to pull up on the AFSHT um, an example of a project that we looked, this actually came in as a part of an actual site neighborhood standards review that we did at headquarters a while ago. Um, this project came in as listed as not in an area of minority concentration because I believe the census tract was about 65% white. Um, but when we looked closer at the project, we noticed that um, the project was across the street from another census tract that was, I think, over about 80 or 90 percent African American. And this project, so the project was directly across the street from a, a, a minority concentrated census tract. The street dividing them. Um, was the census tract dividing line, and so this project across the street from it was not only the concentrated census tract, but was actually another um, assisted housing, HUD assisted housing project 
that was um, minority concentrated. And we, after looking closer at, at the project itself and at the neighborhood, we determined that the site that they were claiming was not, that was not in a concentrated census tract was actually in an area of minority concentration because, well, for many reasons, but one of the things, the, the project faced each other on the street and their entry and exit point actually faced onto the street. The project itself was actually completely surrounded by a high, I think, barbed wire fence that actually cut it off from the rest of the neighborhood behind it so that it actually, for, to the residents, they walked out. Well, as soon as they left the property, they were in the neighborhood. They were in the, the concentrated census tract, and that was really the neighborhood. That was really what a resident who lived there would consider their neighborhood. That is where the other housing projects were. That is where the other retail was, like um, gas stations and fast food um, restaurants. So we concluded that even though the census tract itself, and where the project was in a 65% white, that it would be appropriate in this case to actually consider this project as part of the adjacent census tract that was right across the street, which was minority concentrated. Um, so right now, um, I went into the AFFHT and um, I pulled up the Salisbury, Maryland jurisdiction. Um, and map five shows the location of publicly supported housing. And um, you can see these different icons and the different colors show the different types of publicly supported housing. Um, Pemberton Manor is the um, project that Celia was talking about. It's um, in census tracts. Um, 103, and it's across the street from um, Village at Mitchell Pond, which is in Census Tract 3. Um, and then you can see the populations of the people, um, I think, in the Census Tract themselves. Um, so the, the people in the property and then the people in the Census Tracts down here. Um, and then you can also look at the census tract data by going into the um, query tool. Okay, I think it will Um, so Pemberton Manor, it shows you um, the tract. Um, so this is in census, the census tract is 18% black, 68% um, white. So it's probably not an area of minority concentration. Whereas, um, what was? Do you know what the name of the, the name of the project? Of the other one. Village. Oh yeah, village. Village of Mitchell Pond was the one across the street, um, and this was 81% um, black in terms of the census tract. Um, and then you can also do the comparison. Again, Rob's tool that he demonstrated may be faster for some of this, but um, you can um, pull up the housing market area by looking at the tables um, and generating that data. So, um, you know, this can be, this is another tool that may be used um, depending on what the information you're trying to find. I think that was everything I had in mind. Although I'm still pulling up the table. I don't know if you want to open it to questions or? Sure. Okay, so Kate asked about um, standards for considering alternative geographies, um, and that um, in this is sort of a holistic test, and so it's I'll restate what's in um, the Civil Rights Notice, and then um, the King v. Harris case talks 
about some of these factors as well, um, but I think the notice um, covers most of it. It talks about um, a site being close to the edge of a census tract, the population of the census tract being heavily influenced by the si size of the converting project, and the local under community understanding of the immediate neighborhood if it dictates, dictates a different boundary. Um, and that can include patterns of housing stock. Um, and that's where map five showing, um, you know, if there are similar projects in the same area, um, useful community facilities and amenities, such as schools and commercial areas, and major geographic barriers, such as rivers or interstate highways, are some of the factors that can be used. So I just want to clarify that when, as a reviewer, when you um, get a site to review for site and neighborhood standards, like in the past, we've always just looked at, we've run the census tract numbers, we've compared it to housing market area. If it wasn't concentrated, we just moved on and approved it. So under the RAD Civil Rights Notice, that, that has changed. We're doing the census tract and all adjacent census tracts, which, you know, Rob showed us in, in the tool, but then also we need to, as our own part, do due diligence as reviewers to, to de determine, hey, is the census tract really an accurate, you know, description or accurate reflection of the neighborhood? So what Shira is showing you today on the ASSHT is one way to do that. So one way to kind of look at, look at it um, on a map and just see, like, you know, if you can click around and see, well, what, what's near here is, is, is this tract really, you know, not concentrated, or is it surrounded by tracts that perhaps are concentrated? And so uh, what Shira showed you is one way to determine that, and that's just something for us as reviewers, you know, to we would look at to determine whether we need to dig deeper. We might run the census tract data and the all adjacent census tract data and find it's not concentrated and then go to the ASSHT and realize you're right, it's not concentrated, all everything around it is not concentrated. And that and once we do that, we can feel comfortable approving and saying this is not an area of minority concentration. But because of examples like the one Shira brought up in Salisbury, Maryland, where it's like the census tract doesn't always tell you the whole story. And based on case law, um, we've just like that we can't just go strictly on the numbers and be very mechanical on on when a neighborhood is concentrated or not. We need to do our best to look at the entire picture. So we're I so with these site neighborhood standards reviews, I feel like we're going from a one-step process of looking at minority concentration, which is just looking at the census tract, to a three-step process, which is census tract, the census tract plus all adjacent census tracts, and then determining whether an alternative geography is appropriate. So I hope that helps. Are there any other questions on this portion? questions? Okay, thanks. Did you want to move on? You want me to move on to the next session? Okay. So we are going to move on and now we're going to dig into the exceptions for when uh, a PHA can do new construction in an area of minority concentration under RAD. Um, So as we mentioned earlier, there are two exceptions that are outlined in the regulation. There's sufficient comparable opportunities um, for housing for minority families outside of areas of concentration, and then there's overriding housing needs. Um, what we're starting first with first is this sufficient comparable opportunities exception. Um, I'm going to do my best to describe this analysis as much as I can, but I do want to preface this by saying that this is probably one of the most complex <laughs> Um, except probably the most complex and, and labor-intensive exception to analyze because the regulations set forth a lot of different ways that this can be met, and there's a lot of different data that you can look at and that you would need to verify. So I'm going to do my best to, to run through each of the factors set forth in the regulation, but I think, like I said, these, this exception is probably the most complex to analyze, and it's probably also the exception that we get that PHAs claim the least. So you probably won't be seeing this as much as you'll be seeing 
the exception for overriding housing need, which we're going over tomorrow. So I just wanted to preface this section with that and also remind you, if you do get one of these, this is what your desk officers are here for, to help you sort of figure out this analysis along with you. So sufficient comparable opportunities exception. So the red, the red notice gives three ways for PHA to beat this exception. The first is by demonstrating that the totality of the circumstances show that the sufficient comp show that sufficient comparable opportunities exist. This exception is actually set forth in the PBD regulations and Appendix 3 of the RAD notice for PBRA. This exception is not new and it's something that is contained in the regulations for other HUD programs as well. Uh, the next two ways of meeting this exception that were set forth in the RAD notice apply specifically to RAD transactions only. These, um, I don't know, I would say these were other ways that were that the RAD notice defined and said we would consider this exception met if you would if you meet one of these other two factors. So the first is the RAD notice allows a site to meet the sufficient comparable opportunities exception if the PHA can demonstrate that 50 percent that at least 50 percent of its comparable hard units are outside of areas of minority concentration. The RAD Civil Rights Notice also establishes an exception for new construction on the original public housing site in an area of minority concentration if an equal number of similarly affordable units will be created outside areas of minority concentration. So these last two exceptions that were created specifically for RAD is something that we're going to go over tomorrow morning. Um, so this presentation we're going to stick to just talking about how we would determine whether the totality of the circumstances show that sufficient comparable housing opportunities exist for uh, minority families. So before getting into this, you can go back one slide. Um, we should consider the definitions of comparable and of sufficient. Um, again, these both of these definitions are set forth in the PBB regulations as well as in Appendix 3 of the RAD notice. So the regulations define a comparable unit as units that are of the same household type, tenure type, require approximately the same total tenant payment toward rent, and serve the same income, serve the same income group, are located in the same market housing, housing market area, and are in standard condition. So let's consider each, each of these factors individually for comparable units. So first, the pro the project must be the same household type and tenure type. In other words, if the proposed project that they're proposing to build in an area of concentration is rental units for a family project, we would also only be looking for comparable units um, outside of areas of minority concentration. So we'd only be looking at other family rental units as well. The units must also require approximately the same total tenant payment toward rent and serve the same income group. For purposes of RAD, the units must be comparably affordable to the Section 8 units that will be newly constructed on site. So in general, HUD will, in general, HUD will consider other HUD-assisted units to be comparable. So that, for example, other public housing units, other project-based voucher units, other Section 8 units that are not in areas of concentration, those would be considered comparable. Um, a lot of times we get questions about whether low-income housing tax credit units are comparable. And so for the purposes of RAD, we will consider them comparable if those tax credit units are affordable to families making 50% of the area median income or less. So a lot of times you will see LIHTC units that are affordable at 50% of AMI, but there are also a lot of tax credit units that are available at 60% of AMI. And in those cases, we will not consider those to be comparable. They need to be comparable to families making 50% of AMI or less. So in order to oh, I still think <laughs> in order to be considered comparable, the units must also be in the same housing market area. Um, and we're going to talk about this um, further in the presentation as well. It is also important for reviewers to understand what is meant by the term sufficient. The PBV regulations make clear that sufficient does not mean that in every locality there needs to be an equal number of assisted units within and outside areas of minority concentration. 
says, rather, application of the standard should produce a reasonable distribution of assisted units each year that over a period of several years will approach an appropriate balance of housing choices within and outside areas of concentration. So I think what all of that means is basically there is no hard number for what we would consider sufficient. A lot of times when you're reviewing a site neighborhood standard, the PHA will say, well, how many units do I need to give you to show that there are sufficient numbers? Um, that there are sufficient comparable units outside of areas of concentration. And our answer is there is no hard line. We really need to look at the totality of the circumstances. Um, the regulations use the language that um, whether the number of comparable units is sufficient will be determined in light of local conditions affecting the range of housing choices available for low-income minority families and in relation to the racial mix of the locality's population. So the regulations give us a list of factors that we need to consider, or the PHA needs to consider, um, to what extent these are met to determine whether the totality of the circumstances which support a conclusion that there are sufficient comparable out opportunities outside of areas of minority concentration. So it's important to remember that it is not sufficient for PHA to just meet one of those factors, or nor are they required to meet all of them. Rather, you need to evaluate each factor and, and to what extent the site or the PHA meets these requirements. Um, so the first one listed, uh, the first factor to consider is that there are sufficient comparable opportunities for low-income families outside of areas of minority concentration. Um, I'm sorry, the first one is a significant number of assisted housing units. I'm sorry, a significant number of assisted housing units are available in areas outside of areas of minority concentration. Um, the RAD Civil Rights Notice states that in general, 30% or more of comparable units outside of areas of minority concentration would be considered a significant number. Next slide. So to calculate 30%, the RAD Civil Rights Notice allows a PHA to consider comparable units both within their portfolio and outside of their portfolio. So again, out of all of the factors that were listed on the previous screen, which we need to evaluate, the first one regarding a significant number of assisted housing units are available outside of areas of minority concentration is probably the factor that is claimed the most and the, the factor that the PHA tries to rely on to show you we have a certain number, therefore it meets sufficient, so therefore we have sufficient comparable opportunities. So it's really important as reviewers that we really look closely at the at this factor and at the units they are claiming are outside of areas of minority concentration as we talked about with the AFSGHT example and the example with Salisbury, Maryland, that is, you know, one of the one of the projects that they came to us with saying that this was not in an area of concentration when in fact when we did our homework it actually was. So again, when reviewing this factor and determining this 30%, we have to look at the notice requires us that we look at basically all affordable units in the housing market area. So as you can imagine, to looking at this is a quite a lot. The number, the number of affordable units in a housing market area is a quite large number, and determining whether this factor is met can be very challenging because you're having to look at you know every HUD assisted site, every tax credit site, and determining which are in areas of concentration and which are not, and then making doing a calculation and determining whether 30% is met. So it is really up to the reviewer to do their due diligence and use the tools available to you, whether it's the one Rob presented or the one Cher presented using the AFHT. AFF it is really up to the reviewer to do their due diligence to verify that the PHA has provided a comprehensive list of affordable units and the units are not in areas of concentration. Um, we have had, when we've done our homework, we have found cases where a PHA may have like left off a project that was in the housing market area, that whether it was in an area of concentration or not, that's going to skew your 30% calculations. So sometimes, you know, them if a project isn't listed in their submission, you know, it'll hurt it helps them, but sometimes it might hurt them as well if they leave something off. So we have to do 
our best to verify the data that they submit and then rely on our local knowledge and the, data and the tools available to us to determine whether the PHA has given us a comprehensive look at the affordable units um, in their area. Uh, I think we can go to the next slide. Yes, I think I covered all that. So right, we have to compare, verify that we have a comprehensive list. We need to verify that the units are not in areas of concentration. But then next slide. We can also we also need to um, review the actual characteristics of these projects and these units. So in most cases, a PHA submission will include a list of properties that it claims are not in areas of minority concentration. Reviewers will need to do their due diligence to verify the information regarding these properties, such as checking the number of affordable units and the occupancy type through checking the PHA's website or conducting internet research or relying on other sources of data or their no local knowledge. So, for example, if a PHA is proposing to build a family project in an area minority concentration, the PHA, um, the reviewer must confirm that the comparable units that they're citing are that are not in areas of concentration. They must confirm that these are also family units. It also need to confirm the number of units. So if they say we have a hundred, you know, units at a project that's not in an area of con minority concentration, you need to verify that number, whether it's hundred units or if it, maybe it's in fact fifty units or one hundred twenty-five units. It's important to do your homework as much as you can. I'm realizing it's not always easy to find this information, but doing as much research as you can to verify this information. Um, again, we talked about a little bit earlier about what we would consider comparable regarding affordability. So the reviewer would also need to confirm that the units are affordable to very low income families. Um, defining very low income families as families making 50% um, of area median income or less. Um, again, when you're looking at these projects, it's good some projects will have maybe 100 affordable units, but you know half of them will be available to families at 50% AMI and half of them will be available to families at 60% AMI. So you'll need to determine that how, you know, how many units are affordable at what level and only count the units that are affordable at 50% of area median income or less. Or, or less. Um, the reviewer should also look at the distance of the comparable units from the proposed site. Um, the definition of comparable requires that the units must be in the same housing market area as the proposed site in order to be considered comparable. Um, So I want to give you an example of, uh, of, uh, of a time when we did not count a unit that was in a non-concentrated area, but it was actually in the PHA's portfolio. So there was a PHA that covered a very, very large geographic area, and they, had, they were going to rebuild um, a public housing project that was in the center of the city. It was highly concentrated. Um, and, but they covered a large geographic area, so they had a lot of other family units that were in non-concentrated areas, but these happened to be 70 miles away from the proposed site. And while the proposed site was in an urban area, in the middle of the city, the, the comparable units were out 70 miles away in a more rural desert area. So we considered, once we looked at that fact, even though we would normally count you know, other units in the PHA's portfolio as being comparable. In this case, because they were over 70 miles away, we determined that they were not in the same housing market area and therefore could not be counted as comparable. So it's really important to um, try to determine the distance of the units from the proposed site. Um, the way we've been doing it is just using Google Maps. You know, sometimes it can be very tedious to just have to keep typing in addresses, but it's a good way to really get a picture of the distribution of these units. Um, okay, so that about covers the first factor to consider. The regulations give us um, 
several other factors that need to be considered to determine whether the totality of the circumstances show that there are sufficient comparable units. Yeah. Oh, do you want, yeah, sure. Do you want, maybe we can stop here. I know that was a lot of information and ground to cover on, on looking at comparable units, but it's probably when you're looking at this exception, what you're going to be spending your most time doing. So if anyone has any questions, it's probably a good stopping point if you want to ask about how to do this analysis. Yeah. We have Housing Authority with Brad Shaft, which has an official elderly designation. Can they keep this designation or restriction when they convert to RAD? If, as I think is possible, they cannot have the restriction, but can have the elderly preference exactly what what can the preference be for what can the preference be for? Sixty five and over, less than three disabled, etc. This is from Sherlin. Okay, so for this, um, yes, well, once a uh, public housing project, I know this is getting a little off topic, but surely I would do want to answer your question because it's something that comes up quite a bit. Um, there is no elderly designation in Section 8 housing. There's only preferences. So they would not be able to carry over a PIH elderly designation. Um, they would have to um, use an elderly preference, and it depends whether they're going to project-based vouchers or project-based rental assistance. Um, if it's they're going to project-based vouchers, they have to get this preference approved through their PHA plan, um, and, there's, and it would be contained in their Section 8 administrative plan. Um, if they want an elderly preference in PBRA, they actu actually have to apply to, apply to multifamily housing for approval for this preference. Oh, I'm sorry, and also it would only be for 62. It would be for the head or spouse has to be at least 62 plus. The regulations don't allow it to go down to 55. Dan, can you open up the line? I'm sorry, can you open up the line in case anybody wants to ask? Joanie hand raised. Uh, we have one more question from Kate. Okay. Can you clarify what is the housing market area? I thought previously you stated it was considered the county or MSA. However, the example you just gave seemed to indicate if it is of a certain distance away, we won't consider it the same housing market area. So you're right. So I think um, right for minority concentration, we use um, MSA or county. And I think when we're analyzing this exception, in general, we would use the same housing market area as well. But I think with the caveat that Shira presented that there may be times when an alternate ge geography is appropriate um, for housing market area. So in this case, um, even though normally we would consider it um, projects with, from the same PHA to be within the same housing market area, in this case, just because they, it wasn't just because of distance, but because they were just um, very different in nature, like one being very urban and one being completely out in the desert, very rural, that we determined that there were two different housing market areas. Um, I, you bring up a good point about distance. There's no cutoff with distance. We won't say, well, if something's 20 miles away, it's in the same housing market area. But if it's 22 miles away, it's not. Like, there's no um, um, like mile cutoff or distance cutoff. But we would just need to look, look at the guidance for alternate geographies in the RAD civil rights notice, and that'll go over some instances of where that's more appropriate. And in this case, the one I talked about, I think just because, like I said, because just the nature of geography, one being very urban and then the rest of it being very much in a desert rural area, we concluded they were not the same housing market area. Does that answer your question? Can I just add one thing okay, to that, Celia? Sure. Which yeah. is in the RAD Civil Rights Notice mm -hmm. on that, it talks about the PHA can also propose an alternate right. housing market area so that you could be petitioned to mm -hmm. se um, select a different area as well right. in addition to selecting it.
So we're going to go on and move on to some of the other factors that are listed um, in the regulations that we should consider when determining there are, if there are sufficient comparable opportunities. Um, the PBV regulations also set forth two factors regarding integration in the locality where the proposed site is located. The regulation states that the PHA must consider whether there is significant integration of assisted housing projects constructed or rehabilitated in the past 10 years relative to the racial mix of the eligible population, as well as whether there are racially integrated neighborhoods in the locality. Um, the definition of integration that we are using in this analysis is based on the definition used in AFSH. So for the purpose of this analysis, HUD will consider a project to be racially integrated if the project does not have a high concentration of persons of a particular race or ethnicity when compared to the eligible population. Similarly, HUD will consider a neighborhood to be racially integrated if the neighborhood does not have a high concentration of persons of a particular race or ethnicity when compared to the housing market area. Um, the regulations also set forth three factors that examine whether there are programs to assist minority families to find housing outside of areas of minority concentration. Um, these three factors are listed on the slide. Um, the first one is whether programs are operated by the locality to assist minority families that wish to find housing outside of areas of minority concentration. The second is uh, minority families have benefited from local activities undertaken to expand choice for minority families outside of areas of minority concentration. And the third is uh, comparable housing opportunities have been made available outside areas of minority concentration through other programs. So these are all, these, all these factors are really similar and they all are getting, the point they're trying to get at is whether there are other programs or other ways that um, minority families who wish to not, to, who wish to live in non-concentrated areas can find affordable housing. Um, each of these, the notice gives examples for each of these. Um, some activities or examples of these activities would include um, acquisition of units in non-concentrated areas for use as assisted housing, increasing the payment standards for housing choice vouchers, um, the use of small area fair market rents, as well as the use of mobility counseling to help low-income minority families find housing outside of areas of concentration. Um, so again, when a reviewer um, is doing the review of this, um, it's really, they'll really need to verify this information. Well, they'll really need to a lot, rely a lot on what the PHA submits regarding these programs, but to verify this information, a lot of times we encourage the reviewers to actually reach out to the actual entity that is operating the program itself, maybe either by going to their website to verify these, that the, the existence of these programs and the number of people served, or maybe just contacting the, um, the entity themselves to find out um, about the number of minority families that have been served through these programs. Okay. And the last factor provided in the regulations is regarding whether a significant proportion of minority households has been successful in finding units in non-minority areas under the tenant-based assistance program. And the notice provides further guidance on this by saying, while each local situation is distinct and HUD must consider all factors relevant to housing choice, 30% or more of new leases signed by minority heads of households using housing choice vouchers located in non-minority areas over a period of greater than three years prior to the date of HUD's analysis would be considered a significant proportion. Um, so again, this is another um, factor that we're going to really have to rely on data from the PHA and verify that to, to determine whether they meet this 30% of new voucher leases being used by minority families in non-minority areas. Last slide. So, so we just walked through all of the factors that are listed in the regulation of the things that a PHA would need to demonstrate or to the extent, or how do we need to consider the extent to which each of those factors are met. Like I said before, it's not 
a PHA doesn't need to meet every one of these factors, and in most cases when you get a site neighborhood submission, they're not going to claim that they meet each of these factors. They might, you know, include one or two or three of those factors, and it's really up to us to look to verify the information that they give us and then to look at the situation as a whole, taking into account the, the demographics of, of the jurisdiction in general, taking into account um, the data provided by the PHA and to, to come to an overall conclusion of whether sufficient comparable opportunities exist. Um, again, like I said before, there's no specific formula for determining whether this exception is met. Um, the reviewer needs to look at all of the factors as a whole and, and, and um, just look at the totality of the circumstances to, to determine whether they conclude that this factor is met. Um, the checklist that we sent out to all of you contains a lot more guidance for each of these individual factors. It, it will help lay out just the kind of data you should look at. We've also tried to include um, guidance on how you would try to verify some of the information provided by the PHA. But I think, like I said, the purpose of this presentation was to just sort of provide an overview. And I think once you get the, um, get a submission from a PHA, that will really guide your review. Because like I said, most of them will not claim all of these. They'll claim one or two, and you'll have to look at just the, the, the demographics of the locality as a whole. Um, this is an exception that is rarely claimed. So I think when when you, if you do have one of these, it is it probably would be good to reach out to your headquarters desk officer to just kind of get some guidance through the process and to get an idea of what kind of factors we've considered, what kind of other scenarios we've we've looked at and said this is an approval or a disapproval. So again, there's more information in your checklist, um, and I'm happy to take questions on the factors that we walk through. All right, uh, it looks like we don't have any questions from the field. Um, I know that was a lot to absorb. Um, the, the afternoon was a lot of, uh, a lot of talking and um, a lot of PowerPoint. So uh, thank you for your attentiveness. And I just want to open it up to anybody here at headquarters if they want to add um, anything from the day, any of the desk officers that haven't talked yet or uh, anything from OGC who's joined us. No? Okay. Everybody here is pretty quiet too. Um, okay. Well, please feel free to give us some feedback on today's session. I have received a little bit from folks throughout the day. And anything we can do to improve tomorrow, I know uh, it was helpful for us to hear that you couldn't hear us so that we would speak louder. Um, but if there's anything else that will help the experience, it's, uh, it is challenging being here at headquarters and not being face-to-face -face with you. So anything you can do to make that more interactive, uh, we'll be thinking about that as well. And please feel free to send us your suggestions. So uh, for today, that concludes the presentation. And we will reconvene tomorrow morning at 11 AM Eastern Daylight Time. Thank you.